see. So, but anyway, it is what it is. like to welcome you this evening after we just had a wonderful Mexican dinner. Yes. Good variety of enchiladas A, enchiladas B, enchiladas C, and all good stuff. So anyway, thank you for bringing that tonight. We're walking through a Lent series that's called Thy Will Be Done. We're hearing from Old Testament and New Testament Bible characters who saw God's will at work in their lives in some very powerful ways. The difference that made for their life and what it means for us as God's children today. So as we begin this evening, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, tonight as we hear about the prophet Nathan and how you worked through him to bring about your will and to keep King David in the direction you wanted him to go, help us to see that sometimes our dreams actually aren't big enough. You have something even better planned for us as your children. Walk with us this evening as we do this and to see that your dreams for us go beyond what we could ever even imagine. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our opening song is either in your service folder, I think almost all of you are using screens, so when I survey the wondrous cross.
your sheep, and you are the shepherd. Lord, help us to remember that your dreams for us, for your little lambs, are indeed larger than we could ever imagine, and that in you we have a shepherd who loves and provides for us in everything that we need. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A series of readings tonight, the first one's from 2 Samuel 7, verses 4 to 29, about the prophet Nathan and an interesting encounter that he had with King David. That night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says, Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, This is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be the ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of the earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, O sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant, is this your usual way of dealing with man, O Sovereign Lord? What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Sovereign Lord. For the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great you are, O Sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for himself, and to make a name for himself, and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods from before your people, whom you redeemed from Egypt? You have established your people Israel as your own forever, and you, O Lord, have become their God. And now, Lord God, Keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant in his house. Do as you promised, so that your name will be great forever. Then men will say, The Lord Almighty is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David will be established before you. Or, O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, you have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build a house for you. So your servant has found courage to offer you this prayer. O sovereign Lord, you are God. Your words are trustworthy, and you have promised these good things to your servant. Now be pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it would continue forever in your sight, 
For you, O sovereign Lord, have spoken, and with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. Second reading from Hebrews chapter 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to them, theirs. For to which of these angels did God ever say, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And the third and final reading from Matthew 22. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Well, the son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under my feet. So then, if David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Let's continue with the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. Help us to see that 
You have amazing plans for each of us, wherever we're at in life, and that you will bring them into effect in ways that go beyond our imagination. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, during these Lent midweek services, we've been hearing from a number of biblical characters who saw God's will at work in some unique ways in their lives. We see how that impacted their walk with the Lord and how it also affects our lives today. We've already heard from Isaac, the son of promise, and from Moses, a man who thought he was utterly inadequate. Well, this evening, we're going to hear from a man who had to tell the strongest king in the world of his day that his dreams were not God's plan and would have to wait. The prophet's name was Nathan. Have you ever had to tell your boss that you were wrong? Have you ever had to tell your boss that he or she was wrong? Have you ever had to tell the greatest king on earth in his day that he was completely off base on his dreams for the future? I have. And for a moment, all of the pride and power of that amazing king was resting heavily on his brow like a crown. I thought I was a dead man. But then I saw a transformation take place. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. My name is Nathan, and I'm a prophet of the Most High. The name Nathan means gift. Now, my job as a prophet doesn't always seem like much of a gift. Sometimes when you speak for God, you have to speak the truth even when it's others seeing you as wrong for saying it and even when you really don't know what's going to happen next. I have been wrong, but I'm not sure it was entirely my fault. Here's what happened. David had finally ascended the throne in a unified kingdom. He had conquered Jerusalem. He had established his capital in Jerusalem. We then brought the Ark of the Covenant, or the Tabernacle, as it traveled through the desert, and we set it up in the shadow of David's palace. You should have seen David dance before the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, when it came into town. Some thought the king made a complete fool of himself. As we marched up the hill of the city and the crowd cheered, but that reckless abandon of David's dance and the clear voice of his song made it clear that he owed his loyalty to a much greater king. Now, I didn't know David when he was just a little shepherd boy, but it was easy to imagine him singing to all of his sheep out there in the hills of Bethlehem. That whole flock must have been treated to a wonderful private praise concert now and then. David had a beautiful voice, and he danced with the grace of a seasoned warrior. So the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, was camped out in a basic crude tent while David enjoyed his magnificent palace. I think that upset King David more than he led on to. David knew what it was like to sleep in an army tent or to sleep in a cave or even out in the open air. But now, his power consolidated, his crown secure, it seems somehow vulgar to him that the Almighty God camped out in a dingy tent that David could see through a cedar plank window in his palace. So the king called in the prophet of the time, myself. That's always a good idea when you want to make a big decision. King David told me of these huge sweeping plans for a house for the Ark of the Covenant, that temple where God's glory dwelled. If David had a house of cedar, well then you think, so should God. Our earthly king owed that honor and respect to the heavenly king. So I 
told David what prophets are supposed to tell kings. I honestly could not have known it was wrong. King Saul, the king before, had the same instructions. Once the Holy Spirit has come on you from on high, do what your hand finds to do. God is with you. Now Saul, when he was told that, went back to the plow for a time until those harassing Philistines came in, and then he had to take up the mantle of leadership. But that's a different king, different time. The point is this. King David was set apart by the Holy Spirit. He was a man after God's own heart. David knew he owed his reign to the King, the God of heaven. And now God's chosen leader wanted to finally build a decent house for his God. Of course I told him, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. I mean, you would have told him the same thing. So... I'm not sure it was entirely my fault, but I was wrong. God's word came to me, and I had to take it to David. Did I mention my job is not always a gift? I was sent to give David a message. This is what the Lord Almighty says. You want to build for me a house? No, David. I, the Lord God, I'm going to build a house for you. Your son, Solomon, can build my house, the temple. But I will build your house, a dynasty. A son of David will one day sit on the eternal throne. I will be his father. He will be my son with whom I am well pleased. And when that son of David goes to his throne, his reign will never end. So, I was sent to tell David that his dream for the future was all wrong. At least that's what it felt like at the time. Okay, I guess I was actually sent to tell David that his dream for the future was not all wrong. It was too small. David wasn't going to get what he wanted. However, what God wanted to give David was so much more than David had ever dreamed of. But uh, it's still not easy to tell the king he can't have what he wants. I mean, other kings from other nations were known for killing the messenger. And while David is a man after God's heart, he's also a warrior. I always thought his general, Joab, was behind some of the bloodier politics. But David himself could be pretty brutal. The man who brought the news of King Saul's death was executed for treason, and David gave the order to have him killed. Now, of course, that man had gloated over the death of King Saul, but being a bearer of bad news, especially to a king, not very good for your health, especially when it's the ruler of the world that doesn't like your message. So I decided not to gloat, and I looked around first to make sure General Joab was somewhere else on business. When I went in to see David, he was in high spirits. He was already making plans to establish God's dwelling permanently right there in Jerusalem. I had to get his attention away from the royal architects, the stonemasons, and the carpenters in order to tell him that this big construction project would have to be put on hold. And as I told David he was going to have to let go of his dream for the future, his face hardened, his eyes grew very dark. He dismissed the builders coldly. I tried to tell the king that, that whatever your hand finds to do stuff, it's just a general principle. It wasn't my fault. All rules have exceptions. He didn't look like he was buying it one bit. All David heard me telling him was no. For a moment, I thought I was a dead man. So I gave up trying to make myself look good 
and just delivered the message God gave me. I spoke God's word instead of excuses. And then I saw a transformation take place. As I spoke God's future over David, I could see a proud king melt away and a little shepherd boy return. David let go of his own dreams for the future in order to embrace God's dreams for the future. When I finished the message, the king grabbed me by the elbow, marched me out of the palace, and took me right into the tabernacle. There were no cedar beams or marble pillars, but David hadn't come there to study architecture. He sat down to pray. He poured his words out to God in the same way in which he had danced before the tabernacle with total abandon. I wept openly as I heard a king who knew both his place and his God. Who am I, O oh Lord, that you would make a promise like that to me? The shepherd boy was back. David was always a much better king when he was a shepherd first. The shepherd boy knew how much he depended on God for everything. So David latched on to that promise of a royal heir, a son of David to sit on an eternal throne, a ruler who claimed God claimed as his son. David heard the promise, he received it, and he let go of his own dreams to hold on to God's promise. I left him still worshiping, still praising God's will and purpose, still overcome with gratitude, with a promise beyond his deserving. And I also saw God's heart. What kind of God puts aside his own comfort to make promises to his own people? What kind of divine will commits to individuals with a sketchy past and an unreliable future? What kind of God replaces our little dreams with his grand dreams for us? I had to tell King David his plans were being overruled by God's plans. David received it as a gift. So it does turn out I was wrong. But David was wrong too. Neither of us could have guessed the gracious promise that God had in mind. While it all turned out better than I had thought it was going to, I still had to go in and tell the king he was wrong. And I don't ever want to do that again. When God calls us to let go of our own expectations or plans for the future, it's the eyes of faith. Look for the presence and the promise of God at work in our lives. Our Lord's faithful. His cross and his empty tomb prove it for us. As his redeemed children, we lean into the Lord's promise that he will be with us always, even unto the end of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the true faith of our Lord Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand as we go to our Lord in prayer. <sighs> Heavenly Father, sometimes our dreams, as wonderful as they are, are overridden by your will and your promise. When those times come for us, O oh Lord, lift us up and help us to realize that you are the ultimate plan and promise bringer. Walk with us each day as we seek your will and trust your direction in our lives. We pray that as we join together in the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give each of you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing song, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. just about out of candy at this point. 
and we need people to stuff the eggs. Uh, part of the reason we're out of the candy is we sent bags home with quite a few of the parents of our Little Lamb students, either 250 or 500 eggs and candy in them so they can stuff them at home. But we pretty well exhausted our candy supply. So we are in critical need of candy and again, people to stuff. That area in the back is set up. Kesson's doing an incredible job of keeping every egg numbered. It's very amazing. And the whole area is set up. So it'll be available afternoons, Mondays and uh, excuse me, Wednesdays and Sundays before and after services. And if it's some other time, just let us know so we can make sure the church is open. But again, if you can help with moving chairs, that would be greatly appreciated. And we close as we always do. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.